Thanks again for uh, for having me on. I think I'm still stuck with that last speaker and his. Uh, he said he was getting good data out of an under five year old, and I've yet to have that experience. So I'll see see if I can deploy some of his tactics. Like I say, well, thanks again for having me, folks. Uh, there, there's a a lot I want to talk about today. I really enjoyed the questions from yesterday, and so I'd like to make sure we have time at the end there. So I will try to end a little short so that we don't. Uh, cut off some of that time. And let me know you can see that. So again, here we are, uh, adenokine cardiac perfusion. And I'll talk to you a little bit about our partner first. This is uh, Cuva Pharma. This is one of our 503B outsourced suppliers for the product. Uh, I'm sure you are all familiar with how 503B operates. Uh, but just a, a couple brief slides here about Cuva. Uh, I'm sure all of you know them. They're a well-known uh, organization. They're very large. We're extremely happy with uh, with their coverage and their service so far as are the clients that we're moving over. They've got a great set of facilities registered to, to deliver in all 50 states, so you should be able to get the product. And if you're interested, this is the guy that you need to talk to. This is Mike Scovert. Here's his contact information, or you can send a note to me directly, Todd, at identifying.com. Do that there for a second, and I believe these are going to be posted, so you can uh, you can come back to that. So this is the major reason to to work with a 503B compound outsource facility. Um, compounding errors are largely due to a lack of quality systems. So for many years, pharmacies were in the habit of producing cardioplegia in house. Uh, obviously, there are some issues with contamination or potentially wrong dosage, or in a worst case, uh, mixing of a wrong drug. Centralized pharmacies services solve a lot of these problems. Uh, they are subject to a rigorous amount of compliance and oversight. All of our vendors have this, uh, this set of requirements for test hold release. The product comes in a 40cc prepackaged syringe. Uh, we are pushing out the BUD, and I don't know on the last lots, we're, we're looking for a 90-day BUD. The question was asked a couple times yesterday. It has been 45 days. We're pushing it out to 90 and actually targeting 180 days for uh, our, our goal here. So this is what I'd like to convince you of over the course of this conversation is that, that adenokine does deliver superior my, myocardial protection. In all cases, we see improvements in adverse cardiac events. We see a near 100% incidence of spontaneous restart to normal sinus rhythm. And I'll show you a few studies, in addition to some of our own work, demonstrating a reduced length of stay. And this is both in the ICU, CCU, as well as total days of hospital stay. There's a tremendous cost savings associated with this, as well as, uh, as, well as advantages for, for not having readmissions due to complications post-procedure. So one other thing I'd like to highlight, because it's on everyone's minds right now, is that we are dealing with COVID. It is a tremendous burden on the healthcare systems. We are seeing reports come out from various health systems that there are cardiopulmonary effects of this pandemic. And one of the things that we've noticed over the years of using adenocaine is that it is especially good in very complex or fragile patient populations. So as you're thinking about how do you support these patients that might be coming in for an emergency bypass and also have uh, a risk of or an inherent COVID or other pulmonary uh, morbidity, I think this is an excellent use case for the product. We've seen a lot of good outcomes in especially elderly patients and patients with complex comorbidities. And I'll take you through some of that data right now. One other point that I think is really interesting is uh, as we started looking at segments of patients who have received this product versus other things like Delnido or Buckberg or uh, Plegisol, anything else in market, we are really interested in patients with metabolic deficiencies. And for the most part, I think the thing that's on everyone's mind is people that have a hard time handling sugar. So diabetics, pre-diabetics, uh, people with uh, kidney dysfunction or uh, metabolic burdens of that sort. And we have seen a, a, a really interesting benefit of adenokine versus other solutions, not just from a hemodynamics and hemodilution standpoint, but also in how do they handle their sugar? How do they uh, come out of the surgery? And so we're working up some of the some of the data on that. In brief, and I won't won't spend too much time on these next few slides. And I apologize to those of you who saw it yesterday. Uh, here's what adenosine is: it's a very simple formulation of adenosine, lidocaine, and magnesium. 
Uh, we've held this patent for a few years. It's good until 2034 across a variety of uh, applications and dosages. We have three central pharmacies that are producing this right now. Cuva, obviously, our gracious sponsor today is, uh, is one. Uh, <laughs> and what we think we get out of this product is a, is a very stable, quick, quiet heart. Uh, based on some of the questions I got yesterday, I'll take you through some data on sort of how long from cross clamp to arrest, how long from initiation of procedure to arrest and how long on recovery. So I've got some data pulled together from that based on those questions yesterday. But what we see across the board over a decade of clinical use is a very stable, quick, quiet heart, even through very long complex bypass cases and a very reliable return to normal sinus rhythm. All of this manifests in a lower uh, incidence of adverse cardiac events, particularly major adverse cardiac events up to 14 days post-procedure. I'm sure it's on everyone's mind. We are looking into reduction of post-procedure AFib. Uh, and I'll show you some study data later where we're very close to statistical significance. Hopefully by the end of enrollment, we'll get there. And this is our company. Uh, I've been involved with them for a couple of years now. And the goal is to bring a suite or a complete package of cardiac care products to market. I'll show you the product timeline in just a minute. But well before my time, all the way back to 2004, when this was uh, originally published by Jeffrey Dobson, the inventor, he's uh, still a, a working research scientist down in Australia. He published on organ arrest and protection uh, and, and made these very interesting observations on the biomechanical similarity of adenokine cardiac arrest to natural mammalian hibernation that you see in bears going into their cave for the winter, for example. Uh, and so there is a, an extensive publication literature, literature uh, an extensive body of clinical safety. It's been in, in clinical use for over 10 years. Thousands and thousands of patients have received this. Uh, and there are a variety of studies looking at various aspects of this. We have mounted our own clinical study, and I'll show you some of the details of that in just a second. So last slide on the product here. Uh, this is our roadmap for the next few years. Today in market and, and for the last several years, this is our flagship product, Adenogane. It's in market in clinic, uh, compatible with Quest pumps or a very simple syringe pump. Our next product is uh, more of a one-shot delivery product, obviously to compete with something like Donido. And we're looking for something that's very simple, very single infusion, simple, uh, and compatible with a variety of, of equipment across the, the marketplace. As I mentioned earlier, we are very interested in looking at subsegments of patients, uh, those that might have metabolic disease, kidney dysfunction, trouble ha handling sugars, things like this. And so the next product on the, on the slate is our initial formulation of these three core products augmented by a specialty additive to help these patients that need a little bit of extra support. We do see lots of docs using uh, insulin across a variety of their cardioplegia regimens. So we're looking for something a little more short-term, fast-acting that we can package right in the bag so there's no um, further manipulation in the OR suite. Finally, down the road, we are looking extensively at uh, AFib reduction and a variety of other uh, cardiac-related problems. Uh, once you're in the chest cavity, maybe there's some other things we could do to help. We have a few collaborations with uh, various research scientists at, at Stanford to advance uh, uh, some products there. And hopefully, I'll have some, some better news for you as soon as we get, uh, get back to work here. Uh, post COVID. So again, a few questions yesterday on, on how is it delivered and, and what does it cost? I'll start with my standard disclaimer that I am neither a perfusionist nor a cardiac surgeon. Uh, and so if I say something that doesn't make sense, please tell me. <laughs> but this is our, this is our protocol here for syringe pump delivery. Uh, I'll leave it up here for a second so you can look through it. Uh, it should be familiar to most of you. There's nothing tricky about it. There's nothing fancy. So this is delivering through a, a simple syringe pump. This is the protocol for delivering through a Quest machine. And several of our customers have been using this uh, through a Quest machine for many, many years now. So there's a, a brief protocol on, on using that with a Quest machine. We also had some questions yesterday about the cost to administer. Uh, and so I went back through and I pulled some some information from some of our client lists that we'd had earlier about a year and a half ago about what their total cost is. And as I, I'm sure you're aware, the, the costs are a little bit hard to nail down because everyone, especially given the nature of our talk right before me, everyone does like to negotiate on these things. I don't set the price. Hibernation doesn't set the price. It's uh, federally restricted. We cannot be involved in the conversation between the 503B and the customer. 
So these are all cost estimates based on what someone's willing to tell me. Um, your mileage may vary and your cost may vary. Uh, again, everyone likes to negotiate, but this is a, this is close enough for government work. And very quickly, just Buckberg, Donato, Custodial versus Adenicane on a, on a per procedure, a per case basis. Um, in most cases, uh, sort of in the 90 minute plus minus a bit range total procedure, you can, you can do a complete case with a single syringe of Adenicane. Now, 10, 15% of cases, uh, if you're doing a clinical study for any reason, you know, those tend to take a little longer because you've got to collect data at certain steps and it's, it's not a typical routinized workflow. Might take a little longer. You've got a two hour time, let's say you might use two, but I think this is a, a 10 to 15% likelihood. So this, this could double, even if it doubles at $450 on a per case basis, we're still in the range of, of everything else. Now, one thing I'd like to point out is that everything else in the market that we that we look at that's in common use relies on high potassium to depolarize. And we'll talk a little bit about that and, and some of the evidence that's coming out recently about deleterious effects of high potassium based arrest. One other thing I'll, I'll point out here is that because of this high volume infusion, uh, a lot of a lot of practices end up with some kind of hemodilution step or a cell saver step at the end here. That adds a bit of cost here. Um, I ballparked it at 70 to 100 bucks. Um, so just take that into consideration when you're looking at some of these costs over here. End of the day, um, I think we're well within range on a per case cost basis. And I think the clinical benefits far outweigh any differences on a, on a per patient basis. So one, uh, one paper that was, that was put out by the University of Utah was um, retrospective on outcomes here. This is just a white paper through the University of Utah academic faculty, <coughs> they did um, a look back on 58 patients. And obviously, this is not ideal. It's a retrospective. It's at a single site. Uh, so taking it all with a grain of salt. Um, but here's a few things that I think are interesting. Uh, again, some questions from yesterday about how long is a procedure. So here we are, 116 minutes uh, with a total bypass time of about 154 minutes. And here's the delivery. So out of this cohort of 58 patients, 34 anti-grade, 7 retrograde, and 17 got both. So it's a very flexible uh, formula. You can use it in a variety of ways. And we, we do see a lot of variability in deployment across our, our site hospitals. Initial mean arrest time, this was asked several times yesterday, about 54 seconds. So here's the range, 20 to 180, pretty significant range, but about a minute. Uh, and mean potassium arrest dose, uh, 9 MEQs. This is extraordinarily low. This is very close to physiologic norm. Total mean potassium, much less than anything else in the market. And total mean dose for cardioplegia, very small volumes here, about 66 ml total. Again, because they're collecting, they collected 15 different parameters during this study, I pulled out a few key things that were relevant to us. Um, because they're taking the time to do things a little bit differently and record data along the way, uh, this this dose is a little bit high. So this is more than one syringe because the time in the, in the suite was heading toward the long side, okay? So here's a study that we did in-house. Uh, we contracted a third-party CRO to run this. It is also a retrospective, so I'll give that qualification. And the goal here is simply to compare adenocaine in a formalized fashion to outcomes on the three leading competing products. So that's Buckberg, Donato, and Plegisol. As a primary set of endpoints, we wanted to understand what was the incidence of spontaneous return to normal sinus rhythm. And we looked at a variety of secondary endpoints, including a secondary, a second primary endpoint of time average cardiac troponin levels up to 96 hours post-op. So ultimately we're looking at how is cardiac performance post-procedure, uh, what are adverse events both during and after, and, and how do patients fare overall? So here's what that patient group looked like going in. This is a, a little bit of an eye chart, but really just to say that the patients were similar across both uh, sets of experimentation. So, uh, oh, where did we go? Here we are. A little bit of an older patient group here, so 65 to 70, let's say. Split male, female, nice demographic split, a little bit of comorbidity down here that's consistent across the two cohorts, so essentially nothing to see. And again, a few other clinical factors just to show that all the patients were were fairly similar on the input side. So we're not, we're not cherry picking patients that are more likely to fare better on our product. So 
here we are, um, normal versus abnormal pre-op sinus rhythm. This is important. If you're abnormal going in, it's hard to be normal coming out. Uh, pre-op CPKMB, again, similar levels. And finally, over here on the right, normal versus abnormal pre-op troponin. So 61.54% for those of you who can't see it compared to 6346 so again, very similar on, on the intake parameters that we measured. And here's the meat of the, of the study. The primary endpoint that we hit uh, in, in under 50% enrollment of the study, showing that our patients recover significantly better and they return to spon they spontaneously return to a normal sinus rhythm post-procedure. So uh, 65 out of 67 of ours, it's extremely uh, statistically significant. And the second result that we also achieved at a halfway enrollment point is this, that we do see a reduction in major adverse cardiac events up to 14 days post-procedure. So again, this is a, this is a combination of all the other three compared to adenocaine. Here are the raw numbers. And I broke it down and I apologize. It's a little bit, a little bit grainy. I uh, just noticed that, but, but here's the, here's the specifics. So in the previous slide, this was aggregated. Here's a breakdown of Buckberg versus Del Nido versus Plegisol. And for those of you who can't quite see it, here are the, the patient numbers. There's 60, 60 in Adenocaine, 13 in Buckberg, 11 in Del Nido, and 100 in Plegisol, in the Plegisol group. And those patient counts are the same. So relatively small patient numbers. The whole study is, uh, is a few hundred patients. Uh, typically, you know, to sort out patient variability and site variability on, on an outcomes basis, you'd like to look at uh, several thousands. Um, we're getting there, we're working on it, but it is it is nice to see that we already do have strong statistical significance in very small patient numbers on, rel on very relevant uh, outcomes measurements. So I'd love to talk more about that. If anyone has any questions, please ask at the end or, or shoot me an email. I'd be happy to, to talk a little bit further about that. And I'll share one more set of interim results that we're seeing as, as trending, but not yet statistically significant. And this is reduced ventilation time. And again, as I'm sure all of you know, time on a ventilator, especially in, uh, as we're all aware with COVID lately, this is a terrible thing to have happen to you. Uh, it definitely affects outcomes and not in a positive way. So the less time you can spend on a vent, the better. Now, with the qualifier that a lot of this is clinical judgment, so it's Again, with small patient numbers, it can be hard to attribute the, the outcome effect to the product and not the patient or the doctor or the site. But we do see trending here, uh, and hopefully this will pan out with some additional enrollment. I'll point out also we don't, unfortunately, have data for Del Nido on this quite yet, and I'm not sure if that's a problem with the enrollment at the site or if they just simply didn't collect it. However, I'll show you what we have. So again, this is adenokine versus Buckberg and Plegisol in this example. Um, this is about 150. 40. I think we're missing the 11. I apologize. <clears throat> but 0 0.05. So we're not quite there to statistical significance, but we do see trending down to a reduced time on vent from procedure stop to ventilation stop. So I think that's interesting. We're going to continue to pursue that. Um, all this to say, who cares? What is, what is this going for? And, uh, the problem, I think, in the market, the thing that we're trying to address is that the cardioplegia that we're using today was designed for patients who simply don't exist. So cardioplegias, especially the ones that we're using right now, were developed back in the 60s and 70s. And at the time, the patient population was very different than it is today. At that time, they were mostly young, uh, fairly young, healthy males comparatively. These were mostly virgin hearts. Uh, there was not nearly the uh, extent of, of procedures performed that there is today. So this is pre-angioplasty, pre-invasion. Um, it was pretty routine. It was single and double grafts. Redos were pretty common. And overall, these patients had a shorter life expectancy. Um, some of that might have been to some co coincidence of other risk factors like high smoking rate. Uh, but just we're living better. We're living better lives now. We have better medical care and we're living longer. So that also affects the intake population. Today, however, <clears throat> nearly nearly 20 percent of cabbage patients are over 75 years old and a valvular patient is uh, has an average age of 68. We've got a massive increase in diabetes, uh, hypertension and a variety of other comorbidities, including the, the metabolic burdens and deficiencies that we discussed a, a few minutes ago. And so what we did was went back into the study and we, we sub-segmented the patients that, that had been seen that, that required these extremely long uh, or, or relatively longer cross-clamp times. 
and and this was a proxy to us for for complications or uh, it, it actually co-associated with with advanced age. And here's what we see across these groups of patients with very with longer cross clamp time. So more than 90 minutes on cross clamp. Here's a dedicate on the left. It's, again, small numbers. Patient number counts are 18, 16, 6, and 31. And what we see already is with very small numbers, we still have statistical significance on an improved spontaneous return to normal sinus rhythm versus each individual competing product, as well as if you aggregate them, it's, it's still statistically significant. So, so that's very interesting and very, uh, we're very happy to have um, And then on the right here, we're looking at intraoperative adverse cardiac events. So this is not exactly the same as the previous uh, observation on major adverse cardiac events up to 14 days. This is during the procedure. And what we see in this complex case log is, again, 18, 16, 6, and 31 patients strongly statistically significant reduction in intraoperative adverse cardiac events. So again, with a half enrollment on the study, we're pretty excited to see that. And we're continuing to look into other um, fragile or complex patient populations. As was asked yesterday, pediatrics is, is fairly high on our list here. Um, so if any of you listening want to run a clinical study on, on PEDS patients, please give me a, give me a call. I'd love to, to get some work done. This is again, a little bit of an eye chart, I apologize, but I did wanna show a little bit of the, the raw data that went into that, um, that slide you just saw. Again, this is, this is interim data unpublished. We're midstream of a, of a clinical study, so it's, it's incomplete, but I wanted to share what we had. Uh, here's the patient counts, average age at surgery. Again, we see 69, 69, 57, 65, 60. These extended cross clamp times. And then again, percent of patients following uh, declamp that return to normal sinus rhythm on their own. A few notes here about some things that happened in the, in the course, but, but it is, again, extremely statistically significant. Uh, about 5% of our patients here have an adverse cardiac event compared to 40, 30, 40, 60% in the other cohorts. Um, and here's the raw numbers. So really interesting data. Really happy to see it coming along. We are continuing to enroll in this study, and we've got a, a few additional endpoints that we want to look at. Uh, including, of course, things like AFib, CPKMB, and driving toward length of hospital stay reductions on a, on a significant basis. So that's what's going on now. Um, excited to get that done, hopefully, in, in this next quarter, depending upon how COVID affects clinical trial enrollment. Uh, and so to kind of dig in a little bit deeper here, I've pulled together a few other studies that are showing similar results from our product in a variety of different settings. And I'll dig into just a couple of these. Again, I realize the data is a little bit dense, but, um, but hopefully you can spend some time if you're interested, uh, either looking at the YouTube video or please don't hesitate to, to shoot me an email and we can discuss. Uh, we also have a variety of, of clinical professionals that work with us at hibernation, cardiac surgeons and perfusionists that are familiar with the product and have used it before. I was hoping to have them available today, but, uh, everyone's experiencing a pretty high clinical demand right now. So. I think they were better used in the hospital than, than sitting on the video with me today. Uh, <clears throat> so here's what we're looking at is high potassium cardioplegia versus adenocaine. Again, a little, uh, a little dense, but if you can see over here, there are some statistically significant results related to things like troponin and lactate post procedure. And obviously end of the story, I wouldn't be showing it is that we, we do show better performance on our product, the ALM group is adenocaine versus high potassium cohorts. Similarly, there was an Italian study performed a few years ago comparing uh, our product formulation versus Buckberg. And what we can see on the side here, and it is, it is labeled ALM-I, which is insulin. Um, so that is the one modification here. Again, small patient numbers, 40 in each group, but we see strong statistical significance in a variety of, uh, of measured attributes, in, including troponin and lactate, cardiac output index, uh, systolic function, diastolic function, uh, no net change in overall mortality, but, uh, this group that published in, um, 2008, I believe, did show a statistically significant reduction in both ICU hours as well as total hospital days. One other thing that I'll point out here, and I did include a few, uh, a few details for those of you who had technical questions yesterday. Here was the, here's a breakdown of the exact cardioplegia pro protocol, cardioplegia protocol that was used by the, in this Italian study, and you can compare it to what you use in your own hospital or you know, our, our recommended protocol. They are all within 
a range of what we recommend. And with this protocol, I do think it's interesting to point out that there is a reduced usage of all these fresh blood products. Those are expensive, they're hard to handle, they induce complications. And so here, here are a few of the key conclusions from that study. Number one, improved myocardial protection. I think that's the big one. Significantly lowered measures of a variety of biomarkers, such as troponin and lactate. Uh, improved pump performance. So this is all that anyone cares about. Does my pump still pump? Uh, and you can look through the data there and, and obviously uh, try your own conclusions. But statistical significance and, and a decent-sized cohort indicate that it does improve. Everyone's worried about cost, as we just heard in the, in the talk about negotiation. So it is worthy to note that there is a reduced use of blood products, so 50% less infusion than a four to one Buckberg in this study. And that translates to less usage of all these other products that you have to, to maintain and pay for. And finally, this statistical significance in reduced days of stay, both in ICU as well as fewer days in the hospital. If we ballpark this on a typical ICU day, this is a little over $10,000 in cost savings per patient. And that does not include cost benefits from reduced from a reduced adverse event rate. Here's the publication if you'd like to look that up. I think it's a pretty interesting study. Uh, there's a, okay, did a little bit of work here trying to back calculate uh, exactly what they did based on what they published, which was not super easy, but I think I'm pretty close here. Uh, they don't give cardiac flow rates in, in units that are that are easy. They're actually normalizing to body surface areas. So I assumed that an average Italian was about five foot five. That may or may not be accurate, but uh, these are the assumptions I made. And I approximated a weight here of 80 kilograms. And so the body surface area turns out to be about 1.92 square meters. So you multiply the flow rate by 1.92 and I can ballpark flows per patient. So for those of you who had questions yesterday or who are interested in it today, Induction maintenance free animation, we're getting about 307, 230, 288. Our guidelines are 352, 50, 250. So they're right on, right in the ballpark here. Uh, there is some flexibility here and we do see a tremendous amount of variability in how perfusionists uh, administer not only our products, but their cardioplegia. But this is definitely within range of what we recommend. So I think it is a nice comparative of you know, how do you translate this performance improvement to your own practice? This is what we like to do. So. Uh, next up, I'll go through a couple of case studies. Uh, again, I heard a lot of technical interest yesterday, and I'll do my best to get through that today, but please uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have some additional questions. This is a clinical experience from a, a hospital in the Midwest here. This is a longitudinal aggregation of data, basically. We're trying to pull this together for a white paper right now to consolidate some of this information. It's a little over 7,000 patients. These are all comers, elective, emergent, anything you can imagine. Um, and we, we have seen some benefits in this hospital setting. We're just starting to get into the data. We can already see that they've discontinued use of, of certain products uh, that they don't need anymore. Uh, and with that first data pass, we've, we've made some preliminary conclusions about results. And obviously this needs a, a good data scrub, but we have seen a, a reduced incidence of post-op AFib as well as post-op renal dysfunction. That looks to be statistically significant. I can't promise it yet. Again, we will have a white paper out in the near future. And other things I think are interesting and important to both pharmacies, hospital, both pharmacies and um, perfusionists, reduced use of intra inotropes, reduced use of defibrillators and pacing. Um, these are all things that you can imagine are, are contributing to reduced outcomes over time, even if in small ways. So to the extent that we can, we can not do potentially damaging things as often as possible in a, in a still safe and effective way. We'd like to do that. And I think the study can show that at a, at a really reasonable patient count. So <clears throat> the next one that I'll bring up here is, is a case study that was called, the has been termed sort of the Marathon Man Study. This is a very complicated case that was published several years ago, uh, 1996, I believe. So this was a 71-year-old, very complicated project here. Uh, here's a few of the highlights. Uh, 71 years old, infective endocarditis. This was his fourth redo, I believe. And so during this during this procedure, four times they did rewarming weaning and rearrest. Uh, here's a few of the high notes on this on the surgery. Ten hours total of of extracorporeal circulation. Seven hours of cross clamp time, including five hours of infusion time, 
And that translates to about 72 liters of recirculated cardioplegia. Throughout that whole thing, this is only 250 mLs of, of crystalloid cardioplegia. So if you're thinking about comparing this to a four to one, that, that would translate to about 14 liters. So again, before the, uh, the protocol that we were using today with adenocaine, this is the adenocaine product in performance on a very long case. And you can see a lot of benefits here. Um, at the end of this marathon case, this fellow uh, had a spontaneous conduction, extubated 12 hours later, woke up lucid, good fluid, um, good fluid management, and was transferred out of the ICU after 48 hours. So really good, really interesting case here, um, showing how the product really performs well in very complex and long cross clamp times. Um, here are a variety of the references for all those studies that I just mentioned and went through. So if you'd like to look them up, there you go. And now I'll talk just a little bit more about the background of adenocaine and, and what we think are some of the more, some of the clinical benefits that are associated with this. So <clears throat> at the end of the day, what we've noticed is that there, there is this tension between the needs of the surgeon and the needs of the heart in this very unnatural event where you stop their heart and take it out and do something to it and then put it back in. So the surgeon needs a rapid induction. I showed that on you need to be able to see what you're working on and it needs to be a relaxed and reliable heart. The last thing here is again, having sufficient time for surgical procedure. One of the things that we're, so again, we are interested in bringing together a, a product at the end of the year here that would be a, a single shot product. But when you think about cases that might be exceptionally complex or you might have complications along the way, and that leads to a long cross clamp time, adenocaine is a continuously infused product. So as we just showed in that case study, you can do this for as long as you want. There is no, uh, there is no alarm clock running of, oh, I have to get this done before my bolus runs out. Uh, so there's an advantage here in terms of continuous drip. On the other side of the equation, the heart wants to be, you need to keep the cellular machinery intact and you need to preserve some amount of normal metabolic function. So what does this mean? Uh, as we discussed yesterday, again, uh, a flat line does not mean that everything is quiet. There's lots going on sort of behind the scenes. And this, this publication referenced down here, where Cohen and his colleagues were observing that the energy requirements of these pumps and their movement of ions actually is the thing that's contributing to ischemic injury during a potassium depolarization. So the conclusion here is that to the extent that you can reduce the metabolic demands of the myocardium, you're improving outcomes through reduction of ischemic injury. The thing about, <clears throat> excuse me, the thing about adenocaine compared to the other competing cardioplegia is that we are not reliant upon these extremely high potassiums, potassium levels for depolarization of the membrane. So here's just a, a quick, a quick chart of the protection and preservation composition for the variety of French Schneider, Custodial, Plegisol, et cetera. These are all depolarization based. They are all reliant upon high potassium. And here's the problem with that. When you look at membrane polarity and you look at specifically using high potassium to, to create an arrest, there are a lot of things going on here in the background that lead to, to arrhythmia, lead to cardiac stunning, lead to a depression or suppression of endothelium reactivation. And it triggers an entire cascade of, of pro-oxidant inflammatory and coagulation events. What we've shown in clinical studies so far that, that produced improved outcomes is that we think the ALM, the adenocaine solution, is actually uh, inhibiting these promotional events that you don't want. Uh, the product was initially explored in, in, a, in an anticoagulant setting. Uh, Dr. Dobson did a tremendous amount of work in, in anti-inflammatory uh, blockade and excised rat hearts. And so if you're interested in some of that background, it's, it's this guy right here, Jeffrey Dobson, down in Australia. He's built a career publishing on this, this specific set of events in a variety of use case and settings. Obviously, we're using it now for a, for a dedicated in the context of a bypass surgery. So what we think with some of the reports coming out that are linking high potassium to uh, deleterious events is that we're now sort of at a decision-making crossroad where Aside from delivery or, or components or high potassium, low potassium, do you have a hyperkalemic patient? You know, how do you decide from the variety of 
protocols at your disposal, which one to use on a specific patient. So the goal with adenokine is to simplify all of these decisions to a single standard of care. And for the most part, create a single protocol that's applicable to every patient that walks in the door and needs a cardiac bypass procedure. Uh, whether that's a 78-year-old with diabetes or, you know, again, we're looking at pediatric patients, I think that we'd like to see adenokine adopted as a standard of care across all patients that walk into your, into your operating room. As far as maintaining this balance between the physiologic and the, sur and the surgical demands, we do see an improved voltage control. So adenokine excels at maintaining this resting membrane voltage. Again, Do Dr. Dobson has published extensively on this uh, in a variety of uh, both animal and human studies. And we do see an improved distribution. So there's not a, a, a coronary constriction. Rather, we see coronary vasodilation. That improves delivery around the heart. We've got a, a nice effect on demand management, as we just discussed. This downregulation of cellular metabolism to reduce the metabolic needs is very important in, in reducing ischemic injuries. And finally, we do have a lot of uh, anti-inflammatory events that we've seen. There are some preclinical studies that we're working on right now looking at how to measure this reduction in inflammatory and, and coagulative responses to, to the injury. So hopefully we'll have some of that data out first the next year. Um, it's in process right now, and again, depending on, on when we can get the trials up and running again. So at the end of the day, our goal is to maintain a homeostasis, keep the heart closer to a normal resting state versus a, a very abnormal depolarized arrest based on high potassium. And we, we've also observed uh, a variety of what we're calling preconditioning events, which are, uh, which are molecular events that we think are, are improving uh, outcomes Again, based on these inflammatory and um, <clears throat> inflammatory events. So very quickly here, and then I'd like to get to a few questions. Uh, these are the major components. Uh, a lot of people have been using adenosine for many, many years in a variety of neat, in a variety of uh, cardioplegia protocols and cardioplegia form formulations. This is a, a key component uh, of our product. It is the cost driver of the product as well. It's quite expensive and frequently goes on um, shortage. So this is the thing that determines the, the price for the most part. It's quite expensive to manufacture and bring into the country, but it does have a lot of nice benefits. It is natural preconditioning and post-conditioning. It is anti-inflammatory, really, really quick half-life. Here's lidocaine. Lidocaine is a sodium fast channel blocker. So this is a, this is additive toward, um, toward the adenosine. It is an anti-arrhythmetic and a coronary vasodilator. So again, as we think about blood distribution around the heart, this is one of the primary drivers of that effect. And we also see some effects of lidocaine, and there's some published literature on this of uh, atrial sinus node and AV nodal tissue effects in anti-inflammatory and anticoagulation. Uh, briefly, magnesium, again, uh, superior preservation of the LV function, a reduction of myocardial edema, which is important, and improved ventricular recovery. So those are the those are the main features of magnesium that contribute to the formulation. And that is all I've got for today. And I'd love to take some questions.